heard my comment, I'm like, oh, if you're going to record this, I, I didn't put on makeup today. And like, <laughs> actually, who cares, right? <laughs> What's going on everybody? This is Dante Carter with Beyond the Brand right here on Hits 92.3 and today, guess who we've got in? Hmm. Drum roll please. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Marie Burke. Am I saying the married name on air? No, no, no. Okay. It, I like to confuse people, so okay. uh, I purposely just kept my uh, pre-married name just so I could say, oh, my actor name is, and it works. Oh, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Am I doing something wrong, City? No. City's coming over. He's going to make sure I'm good to go. Make sure I look fancy, smancy. But, um, yeah, so I was sitting here, and I, um, I've been out on vacation for about 10 days. I know. I know. Yeah. It's, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, like, feeling it. But it was good. I needed time away. But um, while I was away, I got a chance to watch TV One. Yes. And do you know who I saw on TV One? Um, man, there was a lot of people on there. Let me see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a very, there was a very good story on there. The um, the Bobby DeBarge story. That's right. And I saw Bunny on there, and I was like, I recognize Bunny. I know who Bunny is. Yep. Yeah, I, I got and to play Bunny DeBarge. How was it? Talk to us about it. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for watching the movie. Um, this was. Probably to date one of my favorite um, experiences as an actor. Mm -hmm. It was definitely the the largest role that I played. Um, just in that I uh, got to be on set for several days and um, work with the same group of people for a long time. Um, we definitely became a family, which is what the director said would happen. Yeah, uh, we're playing a family, but it, we became a, like a family. Um, I'm still in touch with a lot of the actors now. Awesome. Um, and I think that the another thing with this film is I've never played a, a role of a character that was a real a real care mm -hmm. real character. Um, so it was a really humbling experience and I got to not only consider my character but also consider like, okay, wait, this isn't you're not just pretending to be somebody. Yeah. Um, this is an, an actual person who um, you're telling the, the story of when their career started, but they're also still alive today and it's not just one, but it's it's a whole family. So there was definitely a lot of a lot of uh, exploring to do, a lot of considering a lot of different things. Um, I think it, it really helped me grow as an actor. Um, and I hope grow as a person. I hope a lot of people um, can say the same thing. What does it take when you're playing a real life person? You know, because um, I'm in my mind, I'm assuming that that you and Bunny had to have had some conversations. Um, no, no, actually. So, um, so one of the things that I really wanted to help uh, my fans understand mm -hmm. and um, other other fans just of the movie to understand is that when when you're doing a biopic one of the things that I understood pretty quickly is not everybody supports the story mm -hmm. and that was a tricky position to be in um, mm -hmm. I really wanted to respect that um, and I also did not know that going into it um, you know um, I, I got the script I saw the role when I auditioned for it I actually um, I didn't, you know, a lot of times we have a very quick turnaround with, with auditions, so I didn't research every little thing that I could have, so I didn't really realize all the things with the story. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the real Bunny DeBarge, I respect her so much. Um, she's not a fan of the movie, and um, Braille, I really uh, wanted to make sure that any time I was portraying her that I was showing people like why she's so she's so amazing, talented, and just her courage and things she went through. Um, but also, whenever I was talking about the role or talking about the movie, especially on social media, uh, which she's very um, active on social media, I wanted to make sure that I was being honest and that I wasn't just being excited for being in a movie. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I definitely um, you know worked hard to 
worked hard in the film and I've worked hard as an actor so uh, you know I am very blessed to be cast in the role but I didn't communicate about it as I would have other roles um, if that makes sense mm -hmm. you know I don't want to say oh my gosh look I get to play this this uh, person who went through a lot of really hard things horrible yeah. things and the whole world gets to see it and oh by the way they are not 100% on board you know now, obviously some people were on board, some people in the family was on board. You wouldn't be able to do this if that weren't the case. Yeah. So that was uh, an interesting situation to be in. Was it... So let me start off here. How much, how familiar with the DeBarge family were you prior to auditioning? Or were you a fan coming out? I was, I was not familiar with them at all. And that's a shame on me because when we started filming, I was like, oh my gosh, like when, before we started filming, I, I researched when I got cast in the role. Um, and I just was like, I don't know how I survived without this music. Like yeah. the music is so good. Um, my husband and I, like it's the perfect music that we would play like in our living room and just dancing and swaying. <laughs> and um, like they just don't make music like that anymore. And so I yeah. could really understand why you know the generation that was you know our age um you know 30s or 20s 30s i could see why that was such a big deal back in the 80s so um i was not familiar with them at all i had heard of i had heard the song um uh, Need the beat in the rhythm of the mm -hmm. night you know so mm -hmm. i had, i had heard that song um and I actually think I had heard it, I had heard several remakes, like Ashanti, you know, did some remake, or used some of the beats, and Blackstreet, and, you know, things like that, but I never knew it was from them, yeah. um, and, and from Bunny's writing, and so uh, it really opened my eyes, but yeah, going into the audition, I didn't know anything that I didn't find on a Wikipedia page within five seconds. Yeah. I just understood the breakdown of the character, and did my best with it. So, and I know there was such a such a big divide. Was it more? I mean, were were Bobby's like his kids and everybody were they at least you know happy and okay and ready to go or? So one of the cool thing. So one of the cool things was um, uh, Bobby's widow um, Terry. She she was lovely. She yeah. uh, came to set and she was one of the producers on the film. Okay. Um, and so she was pretty much overseeing it. So I feel confident that if, if you know, Bobby's widow is, is involved, then yeah. we're, she's going to make sure that we do justice. And I'll, also the team, the production team, Swirl Films, and the director, uh, Russ Parr, are going to do their best um, to make sure that they respect her. Um, it was cool to hear that Bobby's son, he uh, sang one of the songs. Uh, I believe it was the last song in the movie where... Okay. Um, um, Bobby DeBarge, he's he's playing a song for his wife. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. On the piano, and uh, his son sang that. So his oh, son's wow. son's a musician as well. Okay. And I, I saw one of his posts on social media. His son, you know, was very proud of the movie. Very proud of his dad. Um, I think one of the cool things about the film that I really hope people, when they watch it, will focus on is that yes this is not a perfect family uh the you know bobby he was not a perfect person but the things that he went through while they don't give him a pass like you definitely feel compassion for him yeah and you definitely see like how he how much he loved his family how hard he worked for his family and even how he tried to turn it around um and uh, you know you can see terry and you can see you know bobby's son and and how they're really trying to make the best of life right now and that says a lot about him so um, I hope people will focus on that. Yeah. You know, I was, um, I can't remember which um, interview I was, um, I was listening to, but I was listening to an interview and they always talked about how Tom Hanks is so good with um, his facial expressions. Yeah. And they were just saying how he can, like before he ever says a word, you can, it's, he just really engages you with how he looks into the camera. Just all these little details that typically... I would say I don't really think about right. and as I kind of look back after I was like wow he does do a good job and so I just remembered watching it and even at the very beginning as the cameras kind of going past you and some of the other siblings and before it ever got to the front door or, or uh, the the hospital room door where Bobby was 
I thought you did a great job of really drawing us in with the facial expression, really setting the tone with the concern, the worry, the fear, the doubt. Like, how do you put so many of those traits into a scene without even saying a word? Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you bringing up that moment because uh, that was one of the first moments in the movie, but it was one of the last things we filmed. Wow. Um, and obviously the, the movie starts off with the family in the hospital, uh, Bobby's about to die. And yeah. that's, that's where the uh, movie starts. But um, I would say I, I attribute a lot of that uh, to a couple of things. Um, when I first moved here to Atlanta, I started studying in a class called Just Breathe Acting mm. um, with Barbara Benville and uh, my acting coach. and. One of the things that, you know, she calls it just breathe because she really wants you to just breathe. <laughs> like there's so many times actors, you like we, we overact or we try to do so much and it can be as simple as just taking a breath and just being still. Yeah. And that is so, you know, overlooked so many times. And so really for several years, it was just working a lot in class to just being still. And there's yeah. there's even exercises we would do in the class where it's like, stop trying to be happy, stop trying to be mad, stop trying to be sad, like just feel whatever you feel, just be still. And whatever you're getting from the other person, react. Think about that moment and how would that make you feel? Sometimes a tear doesn't have to drop. It's really just the honesty that uh, behind your eyes that comes from your heart. Um, and we've all been, been sad, we've all been mad, you know, we've all been happy or ecstatic. So there's a piece of us that can relate to those moments. It's just being still enough to um, access it and not trying to play an emotion or not trying to play a word. Um, so I think my training really helped with that um, because uh, I come from a theater background where oh. things are a lot bigger. <laughs> and so with film and uh, TV, whenever the camera's close up on you, you know, so many of those great moments, those, you know, Oscar winners, um, you know, Golden Globe winners and everything, they they win because of, some of them win because of their, their great big um, acting, but sometimes it's quiet. Yeah. You know, Tom Hanks, I mean, he... He did a lot. He was on an island all by himself. Yeah. Uh, Castaway. <laughs> and Castaway. So, I mean, like, he doesn't need to be talking to someone. Uh, well, he was talking to Wilson the Ball, but yeah. you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, um, so that that's something that I would attribute a lot of that to. Um, and then, of course, just um, thinking in that moment, okay, if I'm here waiting for my abuser to come in, mm. um, to a building who I wow. haven't seen for years wow. um, and I've got hard things in my life so I'm not trying to relate it completely to that but I know how that feels mm -hmm. um, how, how would I feel like I don't want to see you I don't need to say anything to you and it's probably more powerful if I don't say a word and I just look at you yeah yeah and I, you know I'll, I'll be honest it was I think that I think you did a fantabulous job throughout the whole movie Thanks. but it was that point that really I mean it's just to say so much without saying a word I think is so powerful mm -hmm. and you know shouts out to Barbara you know because yeah. <laughs> she did a, a great job but I mean just to sit back and I just I remember just being taken into that emotion and then because I mean even at that point you really don't know what happened to Bunny you know you, you, yeah. you just you don't know yet Right. And then, you know, as the layers come back, you see, you kind of, as the layers peel back, you kind of start to see what, not only what happened to Bobby, but what happened to the other siblings. And yeah. even that point where it was, you know, the whole attic, you know, it's just, I mean, it's, yeah. that stuff is tough, you know. And so, I mean, to be able to, to be as, as, as delicate as you all were, I mean, that's. That's a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. I mean, great Thank job. You. Thank you. And I know for sure, I mean, this this movie could have been a series. I mean, there's there's so many things and, yeah. and I know that's one thing people kept saying is they wanted to hear they wanted to hear a lot more about this and a lot more about that. And it's like, well actually the movie is not it's not about DeBarge. It's the Bobby DeBarge story. Yeah. And you can't tell the Bobby DeBarge story without um, talking about the group DeBarge, which Bobby was not in, yeah. but Bunny was. Um, but uh, you do, you see how so much of his life was intertwined um, with, 
with his siblings and you know even his sister um mm -hmm. like he he wanted to protect her yeah. um you know but we we saw how that went and yeah. Um, you know that didn't work out so well and then and all of them had repercussions you know so we we didn't the movie didn't focus on every little thing um, but the main thing that I hope people will see from the film is that it'll make us think about people in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. um, we we know how to make our Instagram look pretty we, we know how to make our Facebook and our Twitter and everything look pretty and um, you know even even you heard my comment I'm like oh if you're gonna record this, I, I didn't figure on makeup today, and like, <laughs> actually, who cares, right? But um, we know how to make ourselves look and, and be presentable. That's part of what we do as actors, like our job or musicians. Our yeah. job is to put the best out there, but that's not always what is behind the scenes. So I hope it'll make people think a little bit more um, about how these people are, are human beings and mm. and do as much as we can not to feed the things that. You know, cause people uh, to fall into those traps of, of, of um, abuse or drugs yeah. or anything like that. Wow, that's a really good point. But speaking of seeing people as human beings, mm -hmm. right? You know, I got to ask this question. So, who who is Marie? Like, you did such a great job of playing Bunny, but who are you? What are what are your passions? What are you into? So, what are my what are my passions? What am I into? <laughs> oh, that's such a big question. Um, well, I mean, in a a little bit about me. I I'm from Montana, which mm -hmm. is always like a cool business card kind of thing because people are like, "What? There's black people in Montana?" Yeah, <laughs> there's a couple. Um, but I'm from <laughs> Montana. Um, I'm adopted. I, I grew up partially in the foster care system, mm -hmm. um, and um, school was like I was a nerd in school, and I I just wanted to do everything well, and I think that came from me trying to make sense of, of things that didn't make sense at home. And yeah. so school was always my, my safe haven. Um, I got into acting by accident. Mm -hmm. I, I was trying to join the debate team, wow. but the teacher from the drama club saw me and pulled me over, and I thought she was the debate coach. And so, uh, long story short, I accidentally got into acting. It turned out to be something I was good at. And so um, I think, in a way, it kind of became an escape for me during some years where... Um, you know, this was this was in the middle of, I got into acting right when I had gone into foster care for the second time, and um, things were all over the place, but I was, you know, one of the top performers in the state, and so that was kind of like my, my focus, the yeah. thing that made sense. Um, so I, I became an actor thinking I wanted to be famous, but then I realized that actually, um, I, I became a Christian in college, and I realized that being famous wasn't the answer to what I wanted and, and in fact any time I had ever you know gotten some attention it, it always dwindled later so I was like dang it so this thing doesn't even last um, so my, I would say my passion now has really been like even in my acting or anything I do like I really love to help people um, I really have a passion for helping women um, whether it be uh, life skills um, Things as simple as, like, I really like doing nerdy stuff, like sitting down with women, helping them with, like, finances. Okay, how do we, you know, get finances together? Because I didn't have anything growing up, and so yeah. I always was like, I'm always going to have $1,000 in the bank, and that was just my, like, my decision I made. And so I love helping women, like, find out, you know, figure out little tips like that, and little saving things. Um, conflict resolution, how to be an adult, like, <laughs> all these things things I just I really enjoy that um, but I really want to add value to people's life I want to add light um, I want to be positive you know even with this whole conversation that's been going on the last couple days with people upset about Ariel like <laughs> I'm so excited about it but I, I want to make sure that I feel so passionately and so excited that she that we're gonna have a black Ariel but in the way I communicate like I want to help people to think and not just like be upset or join the angry uh, conversation, but like I, I love to help add to the conversation in a positive way and hopefully in a way that it will even make you know naysayers be a little bit more open to the idea. So that's really what I want to do in the world. Um, it's not necessarily tied to acting, um, but acting is the way that uh, is the avenue I've been given to do that right now and and. I'm grateful for that. But I think it's always it's always amazing when you realize, okay, this is my platform. This is a talent that God has given me. 
but this is what I'm, I'm going to do with it. And I wanted to ask you because I was, I was sitting back and I've, I've still got the uh, Not My Aerial fan club still hitting me up on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know why I said anything to them, you know, but they're driving engagement, so hey. <laughs> but, um, you know, how hard is it because in terms of diversity, um, I mean, it's just, it's so hard to change certain images and certain stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And I, I really loved, um, there was a woman from, um, gosh, um, I'm sorry, she's a Danish woman. She got on there and she said, you know, um, just so you all know, um, not all Danish people, or she didn't say not all Danish people. She said, we don't have fins, we're not half fish, you know, we all don't have red hair, and guess what, black people do live in our country. And, but her whole point was, you guys are doing all this talk about Ariel, and you know, I mean, you really don't even know what our demographic in our country yeah. is. And so, but it's, and I've seen it more in America than I have in other countries that I've visited, but there's just such this, this stereotype. And how do you, you know, um, as an actor, kind of maneuver that? How do you, because I know it's got to be difficult changing these, these stereotypes and these images. Yeah. I'm really glad you asked that question. So this, this is a, I would say this is a much deeper conversation mm -hmm. that I could be here all day. <laughs> um, but so I'm half black, half white. Okay. I'm adopted. My parents are both white. Um, my birth father, who I was raised by before I was adopted, was white. Okay. So I think I was very confused for several years, many years of who I was. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I, hopefully this won't shock people too much, but I, there were times where I wanted to be white. Mm -hmm. I wanted my hair to be straight. And I'm, I'm convinced the reasons I wanted those things, that's what I saw on TV, that's what I saw around me, that's um, what I was kind of told was beautiful. And so it wasn't until college um, that I actually, I lived on a floor that was a, um, a black themed floor, that, that sounds horrible, but it was a floor for helping people who want to um, focus on like black heritage, things like that. Yeah. Um, and I lived on that floor and it was the first time I was really around um, a lot of black people mm -hmm. um, as, as a, a, an adult. And so I think that kind of opened my eyes up to some things. I remember starting to feel confident about my curly hair, things mm -hmm. like that. So really, I think the media has such a huge responsibility for what they put out there. And that's also why I really want to be a part of the change, because I, I so many things I've done in my life, I learned from movies, um, magazines, TV shows. My first relationship with a guy, this is how it's supposed to be, it's like the TV shows, like everything is, is from the media. And so what, we can't pretend like what the message that gets out there doesn't matter a lot because mm -hmm. if that were true we wouldn't put so much focus on ratings and how many people watched this and putting ads on things you know so these things do matter um, as an actress it's been tricky for me because my all of my biggest roles that I have ever played and including my first uh, my first movie that I ever did um, I was the the black girl um, and I remember a, a movie that I did and I'm so grateful that I that I did it I was it was great but um, I I was on set and everybody was white except for one actor mm -hmm. and I was cast to play his love interest and um, and he was the only black guy and I was the only black girl and I was like interesting like maybe I wouldn't even be in this movie if he wasn't in this movie or um, they didn't determine that his his girlfriend needs to be black you know so that sometimes would play with my head um, a little bit because that happened many times whether it be in commercials or movies and so I um, sometimes would be like well maybe I'm not talented like it's they're just trying to fulfill something and so um, I have to give the benefit of the doubt to the producers and everyone on that end but then I also notice that that is a reality um, and so I want to make sure that even in roles I play, like I've gotten auditions for um, characters that were black, yeah. like that, like the script, whatever's going on in the scenario with the character, it's very clearly that the character is 100% black, yeah. not half black, half white like me. Um, there's a difference. And so I, I had to email my agent a couple times and just express that 
I'm really glad to audition for this, but I don't feel comfortable because this is a slave in the Harriet Tubman movie or mm -hmm. something like that. Wow. And, uh, you know, if we really want to be true to it, I mean, I'd be a house slave. You know, things like this. So, I, I mean, I try to honor as best as I can but at the same time I'm like I want to act and I want an opportunity at that role too yeah you know so I think we're moving in a place where roles are opening up more and things are getting more diverse obviously with this aerial thing like it makes it made me so happy because Disney's a very conservative company mm -hmm. and for them to um, you know to make this decision it was huge yeah. and I, I do birthday parties for the weekends you probably don't know this I, I do, do birthday parties for the weekends on the weekends for kids okay. I play princesses I do balloon animals and face face wow. painting and um, I always used to only play Tiana which I'm a little light for Tiana but okay she's the only one I could play and then Moana came along and now I can play Moana I'm not Islander but I'm the right shade to play Moana. Yeah. And then there was this one time when um, I was requested, someone requested for me to play Elsa mm -hmm. from Frozen. And now Elsa's got blonde hair and she's, you know, Scandinavian, right? Yeah. So I was so honored, but it was a it was a black family. And the little girl was like four years old. And it was her birthday. And I walked in there with the Elsa wig and the Elsa uh, dress and she was just asking me all sorts of questions like when I saw you in the movie and can you do this magic trick she never ever questioned one time like your skin is not the color that I saw in the movie what she yeah. saw was the dress and the wig and your Elsa and I answered all her questions I knew all the answers to them and she was convinced and we played ice tag ice freeze tag and it was great and so that really gave me hope because I'm like yeah the things that people see um they it's it's the adults it's yeah. it's, it's the it's the adults are, yeah. are doing this and the children are fine <laughs> but we get taught these certain things and so i'm like i hope that the, even this this era will little girls little white girls and all colors will say yeah this is Ariel. I mean, like, maybe she'll have red hair. Okay, she's got red hair. She's got a green tail. She's got the purple clamshell, you know, bikini top. Yeah. Okay, she's Ariel. And the skin color will just be the shade, you know, and it won't be more than that. So that's a hope. Um, and I, I really just hope this, uh, you know, Halle Bailey, that she's got to be a strong girl to yeah. endure, like, the criticism that she is coming her way. Uh, but hopefully people will just see like how bright and shiny she is and I want to do the same thing in my acting. Yeah. And I, I think it's also, it's just so important because we, we have to, there are so many stereotypes that have been created that when you just take two seconds to think about that stereotype, you're like, it just, it doesn't make sense. Right. Like, what, what, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like who in their right mind would think a mermaid's going to come out of the ocean and have bright red hair, you know? Like, I mean, think about it. Anytime a body has been submerged in water, what did it come up looking like, you know? <laughs> no, I mean, if you, like, really, if you think, like, even if you're just out swimming, you know, for a whole day and you've been in and out of the water, that's not what you look like coming out of the water. And so it's just, it's yeah. so funny how these stereotypes can be created. Yeah. And it's like, if you don't just take a second to just challenge that thought. Yeah. It's just... <laughs> and that's what it, that's what it's going to take, but, but the way we challenge the thoughts, and that's why, you know, I had a girl post on my Instagram because I shared a beautiful picture of the of an artist's rendering of, you know, uh, a black aerial, and mm -hmm. it's so great, and, you know, someone uh, posted, you know, just very meanly how upset they were about uh, this decision, and, and I just was like, okay, I, if I engage this person and she wants to argue, like, we're going nowhere. But I, w I really wanted to try to see her perspective. Okay, this person, like, why is she so adamant about this? And she brought up the whole, oh, well, Ariel is Danish, and, um, you know, this is, they need to do a proper adaptation of the 1992 movie. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to say one or two things, and I want to say it in a way that hopefully she'll hear it. If she doesn't hear it, then I, her, her response will show me, and the conversation's over, and I don't need to respond. Yeah. She's not open to it. But if she, if I ask these questions in a way that respects what she's saying, hopefully she will respond in a way that 
like it'll make her think because I asked some pretty challenging questions mm. and and it wasn't to catch her in a you know in a trap but it, they were like if you answer this way then you've got to be honest about this and if you yeah. answer this way then you're a hypocrite and not to like make her feel dumb but like I want to really understand how are you feeling at peace with your decision or is there something that I am completely missing yeah um, so I think that's the way the conversations have to be had, and it really does take a lot more patience, probably on the on the side of the people who are, you know, the underdogs um, or the ones that are that are underrepresented. It, we really have to be a lot more patient, um, and that's that's the price we have to pay. But uh, and I don't make excuses for anyone else, but you know. Like, that patient part is hard. Yeah, it, it is really hard. <laughs> that, that patient part it is, is hard. hard. Uh, yeah. You know, because it's, it's one of those ones, like, for me, I'm sitting here and I'm just like, yo, if you are that passionate about Ariel, get the new digitally remastered version, you know, download it, stream it, however you want to get your yeah. copy, and you can, you can still enjoy that 1992 version. Yeah. You can sit alone, you can sing with Sebastian, under the sea, you know, you, you've got all that. Yeah. You know, but to say the next to, to to rob the next generation of having something special, yeah, I just don't. Agree oh yeah, that. I'm I'm sure there are going to be many moms and dads who are not going to allow their children to watch it. Yeah, it's going to be just as bad as Harry Potter. You know, Christian <clears throat> community saying you can't watch Harry Potter because of magic. And I'm just like, <laughs> come on, guys, come on. Uh, but you know, hopefully in time, you know, just one one person at a time, we can change those things um, because. Yeah, it's, it's just silly, especially like, you know, people can be so hot and heavy and passionate about certain things, but uh -huh. things that really matter, we, we're very silent. Yeah. You know, like, oh my gosh, what are they doing at the border and people and, and what it's all these lives lost yeah. and, but we're, yeah. no, we're going to be silent for that. But for this movie, I'm going to, my whole world is turned upside down. And now I'm under the sea. Ha ha. And that was one of the questions that, that was one of the real questions I was asking people. Like, let's talk about these real things. Like, let's talk. And they said, no, this isn't about those issues. This is about Disney and changing the complexion of our, of our, of our princesses. Like, they, those were legitimate conversations. And I'm just like, whoa. I was like, okay. Well, you give me Jesus back. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, but yeah, Jesus. So Jesus is not, he's not, no, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus was not black. Jesus was not black, folks. But no, he, he was not black. white. He was not white. He was Jewish. He was I'm a browner. Just tearing him up. That's so all I'm asking. I, yeah, so, and there so you go. On. We, we pick and choose what works for us, and it's sad. It says a lot about humanity and the work that we have to do. We, yeah. we need Jesus. <laughs> yeah. A lot of them. A lot, a lot, a lot. Well, hey, I really appreciate you coming in, spending some time with us here. It's been a pleasure. Over. It's 92.3 Beyond the Brand, allowing us to get to know you. So um, we're going to hop over to a commercial break. And coming up, we're going into tech, all tech space. Yes. And we have, a, we have an entrepreneur in that space that's making some, some big moves, going international. His name is Mark Hurd, and I am, I'm looking forward to sitting down with him.